Hello, for this week's video I wanted to talk about thrust systems for small blimp drones. So most small blimps that you see use thrust systems that are really designed for airplanes. That's one of the reasons why most people think of small blimp drones as being slow and sluggish creations, that they don't really have to be. The basic problem is that aircraft, or airplanes I should say, require relatively low amounts of thrust at high pitch speeds, versus what you really want for a blimp is high amounts of thrust at low pitch speeds. Let me explain what I mean. So first off, thrust is basically how hard the propeller is pushing on the air, whereas pitch speed is how quickly the air moves through the propeller. So to make our blimps work better, then we need to convert pitch speed into more thrust. And we do that by using a larger propeller running at lower RPMs. What that means is that we need a gearing system if we're going to be using parts designed for airplanes in order to get those lower RPMs with higher thrust. To help you do this on your own, there are calculators out there that are very effective in helping you to find the optimum gearing for a given motor and propeller. Uh, I've used eCalc in the past, that's a web-based system, and then there's MotoCalc, which is an app that you download. Both of those, they're small fees uh, to, to use those systems. Um, and when you're using that, you want to be careful. The one tip I'm going to give you uh, is make sure not to let the pitch speed drop too low, uh, or your top speed of your blimp will be limited. I'd recommend about 5 meters per second for outdoor flying. Uh, I wouldn't go much lower than that unless it's maybe for a very small indoor blimp or something, lower might be okay, but uh, yeah, I'd keep it around 5. But for most people out there, you probably don't want to mess with all that, and so I've included a 3D printable geared prop and uh, thrust system uh, designed specifically for typical small blimps. Um, I'm going to include links uh, to the motor that this has been optimized for uh, and links to some of the other parts you'll need, like it uses nylon gears uh, for some of it, um, well, for the, for the motor mount. <clears throat> and as far as 3D printing, so I used uh, PC Max Polycarbonate for the mount and gearing. Um, I used uh, Premium PLA for the props. Uh, you can't use uh, polycarbonate, or it's harder to use polycarbonate there because it tends to warp. Um, you could probably print this in standard PLA, print like everything in PLA if your printer can't handle the high temps polycarbonate requires. Uh, and it would probably work just fine. Um, I've done some tests, seems to be working okay. You do have to make it heavier though, uh, meaning higher amounts of infill in order for it to be strong enough. Uh, I would, however, highly recommend that you use a 0 0.2 millimeter extruder for your printer. They're real cheap. You can get it on Amazon or wherever else you go. Just get yourself a 0.2 millimeter extruder uh, because that's really going to help you to print the prop gear. Uh, you got to get those fine details and it also helps to make uh, to make the part lighter weight overall. So this prop mount is designed to be vectored thrust. Uh, where the motor rotates in any direction. It can rotate both uh, or pivot if you will both vertically and horizontally. It's designed so that the center of rotation is near the center of thrust. Uh, so that helps to reduce um, gyros gyroscopic forces and things like that. A system like this that uses uh, vectored thrust for rotation is, um, in my opinion at least, a good idea for uh, beginners um, and anything that's going to be running at low air speeds because uh, you just can't get the fine control you need uh, at low air speeds without using a vectored thrust system, at least that I've seen. Now there are limitations of vectored thrust systems. You have no control if the thrust is not being applied. You know, if that propeller is not spinning, you're not going to be able to control your blimp, which means you cannot control it during gliding. Uh, also, fine-tuning for trim is a bit more 
clunky, if you will, with a vectored thrust system. But like I say, uh, the trade-off is you do get a lot better control at low air speeds, and that's probably going to be important when you're starting out and learning to fly. Okay, so that's enough talking about the thruster itself. Now let's start talking about where are you going to mount this thruster. Obviously, I've mounted it in the tail on this particular blimp, but let's talk about the reasons why and the things you need to consider when you're thinking about where to put the uh, thruster for your own blimp, thruster or thrusters. Of course, many blimps, blimps have more than one. Well, and let's start with that. So um, a single large propeller is going to be much more effective than multiple smaller ones. That's just simple physics. Uh, the, th the single large propeller is going to create more thrust for less energy, so if all other things are equal, a single prop will do better than multiple smaller ones. Of course, all other things are rarely ever equal. And there may very well be reasons why to have more than one prop. But now let's talk about airflow. So how air flows around the blimp is very important. The nose of a blimp is designed to push the air to the side rapidly so that it can start curving around the shape of a blimp. It has to do it quickly to limit the friction of the air against the envelope, and that's why the nose of a blimp that is an optimum shape is fairly blunt. And that's true of any object at subsonic speeds. You want a pretty blunt nose so you can start that air moving to the side right away. Then you've got the tail. The tail of a blimp brings the air back together again slowly to limit the eddies of slow air that the blimp has to drag behind it. That's what the drag of an airship comes from, both pushing the air to the side at the nose and then dragging slow air behind the airship at the tail. That means that the air is moving at different speeds at various points along the airship's form. The exact numbers are going to depend on a lot of factors, but just for this example, let's say you have a blimp moving forward at 5 meters per second. And at the nose, the air moving past the blimp is exactly 5 meters per second. But at the widest part of the envelope, the air has been pushed aside and is now moving faster at, let's say, 6 meters per second. And at the tail, the air is being brought slowly back together, and the air is moving slower, at about 4 meters per second. If you put the propeller in the slower moving air at the tail, you will get more thrust out of it for the same power requirement, because it doesn't have to work as hard to speed up that slower moving air. But if you put the propeller in the faster moving air, you will get less thrust of it for the same power requirement. So you can see how there'd be a big advantage if you can put the thruster at the tail. Now, there's a complication. The eddies of slow air behind the blimp are not very wide. So a large propeller like this one will be sticking out beyond the wake of the blimp, reducing the benefit of this slow air. So why not use a smaller propeller? Because, like we said earlier, we need a large propeller to get the large amounts of thrust we need to move our blimp nice and fast. So for a small blimp, you have to make a compromise between the size of your propeller and the advantage you're going to get by putting it in the wake of the blimp. Now there's another reason to put the thruster at the back of the blimp, and that's maneuverability using vectored thrust. Because the thruster is so far from the center of gravity, it has a long lever to use to turn the airship. So vectoring the thrust has a greater effect. You can turn faster. That's why we get such a nice small turning radius with this blimp, is because we have that propeller far from the center of gravity, so it doesn't have to work very hard in order to turn the blimp. Okay, so what are the reasons not to use a tail thruster? Mostly practical reasons. First off, any weight on the tail has to be counterbalanced by weight on the nose. In general, you have to have a greater amount of weight on the nose because the nose isn't as far from the center of gravity as the tail is. So right now, I'm just counterbalancing on this uh, kind of test blimp with these lead weights. But eventually, I hope to put something more useful up there so that I'm not just wasting that weight by carrying lead. Um, another concern about a tail thruster, it has a greater rigidity requirement from the blimp. Basically, the blimp has to be more firm, if you will, 
in order to keep the tail thruster pointing the correct direction. Uh, in this design, I handle that by having a small tripod on the tail made of these carbon fiber um, rods. If you need guidance on how to make that, I could make a video showing you how to do that. It's not difficult. You basically just make a kind of a teepee shape with your carbon fiber rods and you tie it together with string and use uh, cyanolacrinate uh, or super glue in order to hold everything in place. And in general, this rigidity problem is more of an issue for large blimps. Small blimps like this don't tend to have as bad of rigidity issues. Which, by the way, also has to do with why really big airships really should not be blimps. Uh, when you get to a certain size, you should have a rigid structure. Anyway, another issue with the tail thruster is you have longer wires required. So. Um, obviously, if your thruster is all the way at the tail, then you've got to run wires all the way back there. In this case, I address that by using copper clad aluminum or CCA for the main power lines. Uh, you can get that from cheap networking cable. Um, copper clad aluminum has roughly twice the power capacity per weight compared to straight copper lines. Uh, now, you also don't need to run power lines for your servos. Uh, you can run just the one main power line uh, to a pair, a pair of uh, cables for the power lines, then branch that off for your servos and your motor. You do need separate wires for each signal wire, but you only need one per device, one for the motor and one for each servo for a total of three in this case. And those signal wires can be super thin. I'm using enameled magnet wire, and that works just fine. Uh, another issue with putting the uh, thruster at the tail is that it does make the prop more vulnerable to damage. That's arguable. I would argue that a prop on the side of the envelope is also vulnerable to damage, just different types of damage. But anyway, um, there's a few things you can do. The fact that we're using lower RPMs really does help. Um, and the propeller, if you 3D print this propeller with no infill, it's kind of flexible. It just kind of tends to bounce off things. We also protect it from hitting the ground using these Y-shaped tail fins. So the bottom fin there uh, is, is a stressed carbon fiber rod, which will bounce off of any, anything before the propeller strikes the ground. Um, and then finally, there's a safety feature that I've programmed into the uh, transmitter, where when you cut the throttle, the propeller blade folds up against the envelope, uh, again, reducing the risk that you're going to be hitting something with your propeller blade. Um, that's about everything I have. So this is far from the only place you could put a thruster. Uh, like anything else, it has advantages and disadvantages. But hopefully after watching this, you have a better idea of some of the issues you may run into and uh, various designs, advantages and disadvantages, and you may be better prepared to handle whatever issues arise with the configuration that you end up working with. Um, so thank you for watching, and uh, please let me know what you would like to know next about how to build and fly your own blimp drones and anything else I can do to help, uh, help you achieve your goals in this field.